law 57a law of evidence 2 opinion evidence in this lecture we are going to look at opinion evidence and in particular this will be the content of what we are going to discuss for this lecture that is we're going to look at basically two types of opinion evidence one is expert opinion the other one is non-expert opinion we are going to look at basically the general rule on opinion evidence, the distinction between evidence of facts and evidence of opinion, meaning of expert opinion, determination whether an expert evidence is required, qualification, procedure, conflicting expert opinions, and duties of the expert and the court. So we are going to look at this one, this, all these aspects when we look into the topic of opinion evidence. Now, Let's recall what we have studied last semester. Now, last semester, we basically have been exposed into the law of evidence. So, you have, in the previous semester, studied section 5. Section 5 is a concept in which all evidence, if you are tendering it in the court, it has to be relevant to the vaccine issue and relevant fact. Another concept that we studied last semester, which is very, very important, is with regards to section 60 of the Evidence Act and section 60 talk about oral evidence. Right? When you talk about an oral evidence under section 60, oral evidence has to be direct evidence perceived by a witness in the court. Now let's look at it in the context of opinion evidence. Let's look at this example. Right? Now, we're going to look at this example again. I have been using this example last semester when we study about evidence one. So, I'm going to use it again here. So, you have Ali kill Mona. Right? When you study, uh, okay, when you have a situation, the issue here is whether Ali kill Mona. When we study evidence law, of course, Ali is charged for the murder of Mona under section 302 of the penal code. What you have to prove is basically the charge that is actually referring to the actus reus and the mens rea. Now, what you have to prove, the prosecutor in this context has to prove that Ali do the act of killing and Ali has the intention to kill. And to be able to prove that Ali kill Mona, what the prosecutor need to do is actually to produce all evidence that can prove Ali kill Mona. Say, for example, you have Ali kill Mona at Section 7, McDonald, Shah Alam. It is at... Uh, 11.05 p.m. on the 1st of January 2020. So that is the, the, the fact surrounding Ali killing Mona. And Ali basically stabbed Mona. So Ali stabbed Mona seven times and you have a knife. Now, Last semester, when we study about the law of evidence, all you have to bring will be the evidence that can prove Ali killed Mona. So you may see, you may tender an evidence of an eyewitness, you may tender evidence of CCTV, you may tender uh, circumstantial evidence, maybe Ali's friend who knows that Ali has a motive to kill Mona and whatnot. So that will be what we studied. Now, the focus of today's lecture is actually to look at this particular knife and you are tendering this knife in the court. So what happened here? Katakala, this particular knife was seen lying beside Mona's body. So the I.O. came by and collect this particular knife, seal it properly, and this knife is now sent to Mr. T, who is a chemist at the chemistry department. So when we talk about relevancy here, now will there be an issue with regards to the relevancy of this particular knife? All right. Now, when you talk about this knife here, all right, this knife, when we studied it last semester, you want to bring it under Section 9. The relevancy of this particular knife, it will be the identity of the murder weapon. So, you want to tender this particular knife, which you mark as exhibit number 1, because this is the murder weapon. So, you tender it as evidence in the court. So, the knife is relevant under Section 9 because this is the murder weapon. But how do you know that this knife is a murder weapon? So in this context, you need to bring in Mr. T. Now when you look at Mr. T here, literally speaking, Mr. T did not see 
Ali's act of killing. Yeah, Mr. T did not see Ali stab Mona. Mr. T is nowhere at the vicinity of the crime. He doesn't know Ali, he doesn't know Mona. So Mr. T here is totally alien to the facts and issue. Now, if you refer to section 5, Mr. T shouldn't be relevant, literally. However, now, Mr. T, because he has some kind of knowledge, yeah, he has some kind of experience, by virtue of his education, he has the skill, he can now analyze this particular knife, and upon analysis of this particular knife, he found the fingerprint of Ali, the DNA of Ali, and the DNA of Mona. So now, when you look at this situation, Mr. T, from totally not related to the facts and issue of Ali killing Mona, now becomes relevant. Right? He becomes relevant because by virtue of his skill, knowledge and experience, he is now able to link this particular knife to the murder of Ali, to the murder of Mona. Now, in this context, you got to, we are going to look at how can you bring Mr. T here to give evidence in the court because he is not related to the facts and issue. This is where you look at section, uh, section 60. Yeah, you look at section 60, sorry, section 60. 60, subsection 1, subsection D. Now, let's look at section 60, subsection 1, subsection D. You have the oral evidence must be direct. If it refers to an opinion or to the grounds on which an opinion is held, it must be the evidence of the person who holds that opinion on those grounds. So basically what happened here is that Mr. T here, even though he, do not, he did not actually see Ali step Mona, he was nowhere within the vicinity of this particular crime, he is here giving evidence of opinion. And under section 60, subsection 1, subsection D here, Evidence of opinion of Mr. T here is regarded as direct evidence under section 60, subsection 1, subsection D. Now, section 60, subsection 1, subsection D only categorized Mr. T's evidence to be direct evidence under the concept of the law of evidence. Now, how can he be relevant? Because the second question that you have to bear in mind is that Mr. T has to be relevant to the facts and issue to be able to testify in the court. So now, if you look at the facts here, Mr. T here becomes relevant by virtue of his knowledge, skill and experience upon examination of this particular knife. And because of that, by virtue of his knowledge, skill and experience, he can connect this particular knife to the facts and issue. And because of that, we have one provision which allows Mr. T here to give evidence in the court that is under section 45. Now, what is section 45? So, section 45 is actually one of the relevancy provisions which allow an evidence to be tended as evidence in the court it, and it relates, it connects this particular evidence to the facts and issue. And the connection here will be under section 45. Now, let's look at section 45. Right? We are now trying to establish the link between Mr. T to the facts and issue. And from the examination just now, from the analysis just now, we discovered that Mr. T here is connected to the facts and issue because he is related by virtue of section 45. Now let's look at section 45. Opinion of third persons when relevant. When the court has to form an opinion upon a point of foreign law or of science or art or as to identity or genuineness of handwriting or finger impressions, the opinions upon that point of first persons, specially skilled in that foreign law, science or art, or in questions as to identity or genuineness of handwriting or finger impressions, are relevant facts. Subsection 2, such persons are called expert. Now, when you look at this provision in the section 45 here, you are now considering the relevancy of Mr. T here. Mr. T here able to connect this particular knife to the facts and issue. How can he did that? How can he do that? He is able to do that because he is an expert under section 45. So he is giving his opinion based on some knowledge, experience and skill. 
he analyzed this particular knife and now able to connect this knife to the facts in issue. Now because of that, Mr. T, who is initially alien to the facts in issue, now becomes relevant by virtue of his position as an expert, which are able to connect this particular knife to the facts in issue. You get the picture. So that is where Mr. T here now becomes relevant, being the expert. So in today's lecture, we are going to look at this aspect, yeah? the aspect of Mr. T here, if he is to, to be called as, he, if he is to be giving evidence in the court, all right, how can he do that? Whether he falls within the category of expert, recognized under section 45, how does he do that? What will be the procedure that he has to observe when he, he, uh, he is to, to give evidence in the court and whatnot? Okay, you got the picture, yeah? I hope you get that, yeah? This is where we are looking at section 45. Now, when you look at section 45 here, so basically this will be what we are going to study today. Now, right? Now, as a general rule, when you look at the example which I gave you just now, as a general rule, will Dr. Mr. T here relevant or not to give evidence in the court? Yeah, basically, as a general rule, Mr. T here is not relevant to give evidence in the court because he is totally unconnected. So what happened here is that you need to establish the connection. And the connection of Mr. T here to the facts and issue is that he is an expert. Now, when you look at the law on expert opinion, yeah, as a general rule, when we studied it last semester, a witness is allowed to give evidence only related to the facts that he perceived, Right? So if you have example Ali Kilmona, whoever that give that whoever can, that can give evidence that Ali do the act of killing and Ali has the intention to kill, maybe the one relevant. So you are you are making it relevant because section sixty says so. Yeah, section sixty is saying that you are giving evidence that you perceived. Yeah, it means that you are only giving a lot to give evidence of fact that you perceive using your senses, right? So that is why general rule on the very basic of the very uh, raw definition of oral evidence, you have to give evidence that you perceive, right? However, in situ certain situation, you have that. In certain situation, the court may look at opinion of a witness. And opinion of a witness here is actually categorized into part of evidence under section 60, when we study about section 60, subsection 1, subsection D just now, yeah, which I have explained to you. Now, why is it that the court, right? Why is it that the court uh, require help from an expert here? Yeah, the court require help from an expert because the court is not in the position to form a correct judgment without the help of a person. Now, if you look at the example here, so you basically have a situation where Ali kill Mona, right? You have this particular knife. Yeah, you have this particular knife. The court want to make sure whether this is basically the murder weapon. And the court, by using naked eye, looking at this particular knife which has blood on it, will not going to be able to confirm this knife is actually the murder weapon or not. So because of that, the judge require an informed help or informed opinion and the opinion will be by the assistance of an expert. That is why when you look at uh, expert evidence, the rationale as to why the court requires expert is, is to get help, is for the court to get help from someone who has special skill and knowledge. And by virtue of section 60, subsection 1, subsection D here, evidence of an expert here is regarded as direct evidence and it has to be given orally in the court okay now so if you look at um, let's see all right so this will be so when when you have a court the court here giving evidence in the court sorry the court here uh, listening to evidence of an expert in the court because the nature of an expert evidence here is regarded as direct evidence under section 60, subsection 1, subsection D, you have to bear in mind that 
the expert here is only giving justification as to whether this particular knife is the murder weapon. At the end of the day, the court will have to make a decision whether to accept or not to accept the opinion given by this ex expert. You have to bear in mind at the end of the day, an expert is only a witness to give evidence in the court. The decision maker remains in the hands of the court. So it is for the court to decide whether or not to take this particular opinion and it will be based on the justification given by a particular expert when he testifies in the court. Alright? Okay. Now, so basically if you look at the notes here, there is some kind of distinction between evidence of facts and evidence of opinion. Now let's look at this um, PowerPoint here a little bit. Right? So in this case of Gary, Tim, Gary Lim Ting Hao basically explained to you why is it that the judge has to have some kind of reliance to uh, the expert because the judge will not be able to come to a decision because of lack of knowledge and skill. Now let's look at here. Yeah? There is a distinction between evidence of fact and evidence of opinion. Okay. Now. Now, when we talk about in our in our initial discussion just now, if you are to tender evidence in the court, evidence that you tender must reflect the fact, right? Evidence that you tender in court has to reflect the fact. So, maknanya, you are talking about evidence of fact. If whatever you perceive, that will be the evidence of fact that you perceive. That will be under section sixty, all right? And evidence of fact will only be will be basically relevant because you are giving evidence as to what you perceive. Now, what is the distinction between evidence of facts and evidence of opinion? Right? Last semester we studied about evidence of facts. Say you have a situation where Ali killed Mona. You have Zack who actually saw Ali stabbed Mona, right? So, Zach here is giving evidence of fact. When you bring Zach here to give evidence in the court, Zach here is giving evidence as to what he perceived and the relevancy and admissibility of Zach evidence will fall under the ordinary rules of admissibility of evidence, yeah, which we have studied last semester. It falls within section uh, basically 6 to uh, we have studied last semester section 9 that will be the general relevancy situation so if you have Zach here saw so Ali stab Mona so the act of stabbing here so Zach evidence may be relevant under section 7 which is a general relevancy provision to reflect state of things as to how the incident happened so this is where maknanya if you are to tender Zach as evidence in the court the relevancy will fall under ordinary relevancy provision it can be tendered it will be relevant and admissible as of right the moment it falls within the category of relevancy of this kind. But when you talk about evidence of opinion, yeah, if you talk about evidence of opinion here, as a general rule, you have Katadi just now, Dr. T. Dr. T is now related to the fraction issue. Yeah, Dr. T cannot be called to give evidence in the court. So you have to establish the link between Dr. T to the fraction issue. In this context, Dr. T basically examined this knife and by virtue of the examination, Dr. T able to connect Ali, the knife, to the murder, of, the murder committed by Ali against Mona. So, for you to bring evidence of opinion, it has to be admissible provided that it falls under Section 45 of the Evidence Act up until Section 50. So, when you refer to your Evidence Act, the topic on opinion evidence, it is within section 45 to section uh, 50, 51 of the Evidence Act. Okay? Now, the second distinction between evidence of fact and evidence of opinion is that the court will have no discretion, basically. Remember, when you talk about relevancy, relevancy is a question of law. So, what the moment the evidence is relevant it will be admissible to be tendered as evidence in the court. The court has no discretion to reject an evidence which is regarded as relevant, as a general rule. Of course, we have situation in the case of Gui Ching Ang, but you have to have some peculiar situation to make 
the court exercising the discretion to reject relevant evidence. But as a general rule, if an evidence is relevant, it will be admissible. So if you have this particular knife, the knife was properly sealed, yeah? The knife was found at the scene of the crime. You find the blood on the knife, right? Basically, there's some kind of fingerprint on the knife. So you want to tender this particular knife. This particular knife is relevant as of right. That is, this knife is the real physical evidence. You, this, you are tendering as a murder weapon, right? So you are tendering. So basically, when you talk about evidence of fact, it is a fact that this knife is a murder weapon. You, the tendering of this particular knife will be as of right under the general relevancy provision because this is an evidence of fact. Zack perceived the act of killing. Zack can be called to give evidence in the court and his evidence will be relevant as of right. Yeah, because, and the court cannot basically reject Zack evidence because, well, I don't like your face, so I reject it. So the court cannot say that. The moment Zack is able to give evidence of Ali stabbing Mona, Zack evidence here will be a relevant fact. The court has to accept this particular evidence. Okay? Now, it's different from evidence of opinion. Remember, when we talk about evidence of opinion here, Dr. T here is using his opinion based on his experiment. He analyzed this particular knife. He found that using some kind of SOP, using some kind of a guideline in conducting the experiment, he found that, yeah, he found that this knife here contained the blood that belongs to Ali and Mona. Or I thought it contains the blood of Mona. It has fingerprints of Ali and DNA of both Ali and Mona. By virtue of my examination, I conclude that this knife is actually a murder weapon. So what happened here is that Mr. T here is giving opinion that this knife is a murder weapon based on his judgment and skill and experimentation. Now, if and if Mr. T here is giving evidence of opinion, the relevancy will be under section 45 and his opinion must be supported with justification or reasons why he reached that opinion. And the moment he gives his opinion, it will be up to the court, yeah? It will be up to the court to accept or reject, yeah? To accept or reject. So if you have more than one person giving evidence of opinion, Say like what happened in the case of Anwar Ibrahim. Yeah, in the case of Anwar Ibrahim, so do me too. You have basically the DNA of Anwar Ibrahim which was examined by the government uh, chemist and confirmed that the DNA is actually Anwar Ibrahim. And Anwar Ibrahim also have called the expert from Harvard University examining, giving evidence relating to the DNA. So you have two conflicting expert opinion. If you have two conflicting expert opinion, both are experts fall under section 45. However, it is up to the court to decide which opinion I want to choose, which opinion I want to follow. So when you talk about uh, evidence of opinion, the court has the discretion either to reject or to accept which opinion. Because the judge has a duty to decide. Yeah, the judge has a duty to form his own opinion based on the justification given by the expert. So that is why when you talk about evidence of opinion, the court is not bound to accept evidence of opinion. And the third one, the third distinction between evidence of fact and evidence of opinion is that when you talk about evidence of fact, as far as much as possible, you refer to section 118. When you look at section 118, now let's look at section 118. Yeah, last semester, I have actually mentioned to you about section 118 in passing. Now, when you look at section 118, who may testify? All persons shall be competent to testify unless the court considers that they are prevented from understanding the questions put to them or from giving rational answers to those questions by tender years, extreme old age, disease, whether of body or mind, or any other cause of the same kind. Now, if you refer to section 118 here, who may testify? So basically, anybody who are competent are able to give evidence of fact. So under section 118, when you are giving evidence of fact, anybody can give evidence of fact. So you are opening it up to anybody as long as 
he understand the questions put to them right and he is not subject to any disease of the mind or whatever under section 118 so basically another distinction is that evidence of fact anyone can be a witness but when you talk about evidence of opinion can anyone be a witness no basically when you talk about evidence of opinion section 45 says who those who can give evidence of opinion will be under section 45 will be an expert so this is a category of persons that can give evidence under 45 you have to be an expert and of course section 47 and 50 talk about uh, opinion evidence which are non-expert even though you're referring to evidence of non-expert under section 47 up until 50 it specified this particular provision specified the kind of person that can give opinion so not everybody can give evidence of opinion under section under section uh, uh, sorry evidence of opinion under section 45 until section 51 all right so in this lecture basically i have exposed to you yeah what does it mean okay how do you link expert evidence to the facts and issue right and i have given you the distinction between right an expert sorry between evidence of opinion and evidence of fact all right we will put a pause to this lecture i will move on next in our next video with regards to the next lecture